My name is Alan Long, a Snowflake Senior Sales Engineer in New York City. I'm going to demonstrate and build from scratch an open source stock market trades, cash, and P&L system. These types of systems are used in big banks, hedge funds, and in retail trading apps, like the ones that were popular during COVID. You're going to see us query 3 billion rows in only 3 seconds with Snowflake Small Compute. Today, we are going to show how to build this open source demo. I'm going to show how to demo it. We're going to create a, this dashboard, this interactive dashboard, and we're going to show you all of the, the code behind it, how to build it, um, how we get the stock market data. And this is all on Snowflake, this free stock market data from NEMA and or NOMA, I'm not sure the pronunciation, but it gives you stock market and many other uh, data sets all for free uh, on Snowflake. And then I will show you how to build this scripts and run some of these scripts to show you the end product. And in order to build this, we're just going to go to this place. I will, this uh, link, I will put it in the description and it shows you how to build it, shows you what the problem is. There's YouTube playlist and a medium blog, and eventually there'll be a quick start, uh, so eventually we're going to have a quick start on this guide uh, as well, a quick start guide. So very easy to set up. And we're basically just going to run these four scripts. Uh, total is about seven minute runtime and each script is item pulling, meaning you could rerun it again. And so in order to build the demo, we're going to run these uh, four setup scripts and right here. And as you can see, it's 10, 20, 30, 40, pretty easy to set up. And for the snow site portion, we're going to go to the snow site folder and set up the filters and the queries there. So let's, I'm going to currently run the script 40 query. So I want to show you the end, the end product, right? So the end product is this. If you're building, let's say for retail traders, like a Robinhood retail trading app, you want to use your trades, cash and position, right? What trades, buy, sells and holds. Uh, what were the actual granular actions? Now, those were at a day-to-day -day granularity just for uh, demonstration purposes. Obviously, you could go down to hourly, minutes, second, even down to, I think it's nanosecond as well. We have tick history with, with facts set on, on Snowflake as well. For this demo, it's a kind of like one-on-one demo. It's just at the day level granularity. So as you see, it's the closing prices uh, for all time that we have this data. And then NOMA provides over 40 years of history. So as you can see, for this ticker symbol, which is Caterpillar, we have the data for or the closing prices since uh, 1981, I believe, is when we had to start on this data set. And as you can see, as I scroll, I see the various market values and profit and loss of this uh, randomly generated portfolio data, right? So ultimately, behind the scene, there's 3 billion rows of data here. And this is for Caterpillar. This is for this trader. And we're using a small warehouse. Like you see, I'm not using any computing power right now, uh, but it is a very efficient because we're, even though there's 3 billion rows behind this, it will uh, know how to filter for it very well. So we'll have a deeper dive later on as to how to run it. I'm just going to give you the overview, the quick one. So as you can see, just give you a taste and then we're going to build it, right? So here's the script 40, right? And we'll show you how to name mode in a second just setting my context of who I am and essentially what we're going to build, right? We can resize the warehouse. It's a, 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 again, it's a small, right? We could always also click this and then resize up and down. But I'm fine with the small. And so I'll run this next query on a, on a Mac. I am using keyboard shortcuts, command return to, to return that. Or you could just click this blue button right here and that will also run it. And as you can see, running that first query turn on a warehouse, that's where you could see this kind of like green light right there. That means the, that warehouse has started. So it's very, uh, you know, instantly assigned me a small computer behind the scenes. Small is essentially 16 cores. If you work on the computing size, extra small is eight cores, small is 16 cores, medium is 32 cores. So each one just doubles the previous size. But because we're designed efficiently, we only need a small computer and that's 1.8 seconds. If I wanted to see what is the current profit and loss for a trader named Charles, as you can see, that only took three seconds. And we could see this data as of March 24 of 2023. Here, this was his various positions, the number of shares, 
they had the number of the cash used cumulative. That's a negative number because they spent cash to buy these shares at this closing price. And so this was at the closing price on that day on what to say was this March 24. And the, the market value was 186 million and their profit and loss was 166 million. So that's their number one best leader in profit and loss. So this trader has been doing actually quite well. So bonus time would be quite quite happy for this trader. Or if you had a Robinhood um, retail trading app, it would be a pretty good position as well. And so just going to show you some sample queries, right? This is ranked profit and loss for a random trader. Uh, there's no indexes, statistics, vacuum, or maintenance. So one of the benefits of Snowflake is it's pretty much near zero maintenance. So all you have to do when you show, when we build it, is you just have to sort your data. In our case, we're sorting it. As you can see, when I float over the trade table, I'm over here in databases. The database is named FinServe AM. I'm in the public schema. And the trade table, as you can see, there's 3 billion rows right there. And if you see the cluster key, it says linear trader symbol date. Just essentially, anytime we choose to write queries, as long as we include trader symbol and or date, it's going to perform pretty well. And as you can see here, this is getting the current position for this trader. So, you know, six. 0.8 seconds, pretty pretty good time, right? And so as you could see, you could see time series data. What is my position as of a date? As you could see, January 2nd and every day going forward, you could see the cash actually spending cash and they were accumulating shares. So this is how they accumulated that very nice profit and loss. They started trading in January 2nd. They spent about a million dollars in cash every day for the first as you could see, well, 30 days, we're going to look at the trade level granularity soon, but you can see their number of shares were accumulating every day. The closing price back then was 20 right after a couple of splits market value as you can see, and then day one, obviously the PNL was zero and the day two, their PNL dropped 31,000, but this started catching up quite nicely as time went on. They were doing a nice dollar cost average strategy. Now, if we were to look at um, the random trader that we picked before, which was happened to be Timothy Scott in my case, since Apple, if they started accumulating the position in 1981, their PL, as you can see, was lost for a while, fluctuating back and forth as we we're looking into PL. But as you can see, we essentially have a single version of truth. For a big bank, hedge fund, insurance firm, this is what our our demo is demonstrating. You know, across three billion rows of this trade, and I'm qu querying a position. This is just a regular view. I could always float over this view right here and click on this kind of like um, open view details in a new tab. So I click on this and see the definition as to what's going on. And what you're going to notice is that. There's, as you can see, column level comments, the comment on the view, and it's not materialized at all, right? It is just a regular view. And what is it doing? It's interjoining that 3 billion row trade table with this stock price history table. That's where we're getting the stock prices from. And it's doing some window uh, functions, as you can see, number of shares partitioned by to get the to get the number of shares cumulative and cash cumulative. Essentially, we've created a real time uh, trade cash and profit and loss system and open source it, which is, is pretty, pretty wild. Right. And then this is the position now view that you saw. There's actually probably a more efficient way to do this, but this is how I'm currently figuring out what the date is. Just getting the, the max price for Apple and snow. At some point I'm going to improve this demo to do that in a more efficient way, but I'm getting three second performance as you saw before, even with that query. Always, always as a developer, always interested in continuing to improve. Okay. So what did we just show so far? We showed query the information schema, right? This is, I don't think I covered this, but this is showing you the trade level comments, right? The base table has these comments. This is what the trade is. Essentially, this is like your data dictionary and a lot of people make this searchable on Snowflake. You could see the column level definitions, especially as folks are trading, you know, million dollar, multi-million dollar positions. And then the views and what and what they're all they're always in. So and then we showed the position view and grabbed a random trader right here. There's over 100 different traders that we synthetically created using a Python function. 
that, that I will show you uh, soon as we build this demo. We showed uh, for this trader Charles, for Tesla, and also for Apple for this random trader. Okay, so moving on, let's just see some records from this trade table. As you could see, um, you could see the buy, the the trade level granularity, right? The the symbol, the, the exchange that was on the action, buy, sell, or hold are the three options. The closing price number of shares and, and the cash views, right? And, and which trader made that action? The PM is a portfolio manager. So a portfolio manager, in our case, manages the trader. And in, in general, in generally, that's how it works in, um, in you know asset management firms. So it's kind of like the manager of the various traders. So we synthetically create the the portfolio managers as well. Okay, so and. I wanted to show you, we there's three caches inside Snowflake, C-A-C-H-E. The first one is the metadata cache. So if you run a select count star from a, from a trade table, let's say, there's three billion rows there. Notice it only took 44 milliseconds. I remember I used to um, be a DBA for a certain RDBMS relational database management system, and a select count star on a billion row table would take probably an hour or two. And, but on Snowflake, it takes milliseconds, right? Sub-second. Because there, Snowflake always knows how many rows are inside a, a table. And that's very important for the three caches, right? So this is the metadata cache. There's also another cache, which is the uh, query cache. So let's see if we could see the query cache. If I run this one, because we ran this one earlier, let me see if I run this one again. This is our second cache. Notice that was 90, 94 milliseconds, right? Why was it so fast to query over this, um, you know, 3 billion rows, ultimately 3 billion rows? If you look at the view query profile again, right, you see query result reuse. That's the, the second or the third cache. This is the best cache in, in my humble opinion, because for 24 hours, as long as the underlying data hasn't changed, meaning there hasn't been an insert update or delete on the table, and the query is deterministic. So you can't use like current day, current account, any of those current context type functions. The Snowflake can guarantee that those results are accurate. And that's for the past 24 hours. So, as, so every time anybody runs the query that it essentially is this query again, and it could be another user who is logged into my account and my account in this case happens to be this MQA22344. They're going to get back the exact same result, you know, sub second. And that's incredibly powerful and cost efficient, which is one of the reasons why Snowflake is a disruptive technology because it has access to this essentially unlimited cache, right? Because it uses the, the, the economies of sales of cloud to provide essentially all users in your company. And you could, let's say, be at, um, let's say, a Bank of America where, where it is, I guess, 200,000 employees. And if they all wanted to connect to the same Snowflake account at the same time because of Snowflake's ability to have unlimited concurrency, and even though I have a max cluster count here set at one, you could set it to 10 and you have folks round robin and essentially they will always be able to connect to snowflake at the same time with unlimited read concurrency so that's pretty mind-blowing when it comes to creating a system such as snowflake to support all of your largest big data needs and pretty much out of the box right so so what did we show quick recap we showed the metadata cache when we did the uh, select count star from from this table I think it also applies to like select min or max, especially when it's on the cluster key, right? And also, actually, let's do that. It's a, if I have a trade table and I want to get the minimum symbol, let's see if that does it as well. Min symbol. And let's get the max symbol while we're at it. This should also be in the metadata cache. I could be wrong, but yeah, I might be wrong. But something to test out is, you know, when it is in the cache or not. Well, let's actually see this. This took eight seconds. Yeah, it was a table scan, but maybe I'll get to see what my third cache was. Percentage scan from cache. This is going to be the third cache. Okay, so that was not in the metadata cache. I'll, I'll go find out why at some point. But 
the percentage gain from the cash was zero. So this is very interesting. I want to get, I want to show this to be higher than zero one time. Then you're going to know the third cash was at the warehouse level, possibly because my warehouse continues to auto suspend. That is why, um, essentially when this warehouse does not auto suspend, because I have it sus auto suspend at, at two minutes, essentially under 20 seconds, it is turning off. Let me run this again and see if it hits the, the 24 hour cash. Okay, good. Well, at least it hit the 24 hour cash. So you can see the benefits of running it twice. And like I said, the underlying data hasn't changed. So the query result reuse is there. Oh, I know. So now my goal is to hit the third cash. Now, remember to hit the third cache, if I run this, this is going to hit the, the query result cache, right? The 24 hour one that you see that was really fast. But if notice what happens, I'm going to change the date to, let's say the sixth, right? January 6th. If I run this, this is a new query to Snowflake. So it still has to, it, it is no longer the query result cache, but it should be in the other cache, which is the virtual warehouse cache. So let's see what happens when we run that one. There you go. See, now it took two seconds, still very efficient. If we go, so to do that again, we click the ellipsis. I'm going to slow that down. And then you see the view query profile, right? So when we did that, we saw this query. And as you can see, byte scan, perfect. This is what I wanted to show you. Percentage scan from cash is 6% because essentially there was, in, in, in Snowflake, there's kind of like the micro partitions, which is our Snowflake's compressed, optimized, encrypted, and governed kind of like data structure for cloud storage. And in, in my case, I haven't been using Snowflake AWS. So essentially it's a 16 megabyte comp highly compressed, optimized, encrypted government compressed down to 16 megabytes of compressed data. And then everything is charged and computed. And that's a benefit because everything's just super efficient and fast, right? And so what happens is when it has a virtual warehouse, in my case, it's called FinServe DevOps Warehouse, there's some solid state drives there. And it's also caching data from that micro partition. So I don't know how much faster it is, but generally it is faster. And that's why, you, why I like seeing percentage coming from cache. And that's, again, the benefit of Azure has more users connecting to the same kind of virtual warehouse. We, see, we recommend this for like business intelligence use cases. Then uh, you would see a benefit there. So like the finance team would, would be using the finance warehouse. The sales team would be seeing the sales warehouse because generally they would be using the same virtual warehouse, right? So we're seeing that kind of like third cache right there. So again, this, the benefits of Snowflake is you see the three caches there, the compute, again, only just using small power because I've architected and always added my data as sorted, right? So moving on, right? And, and so we, we saw this cache again, um, the metadata cache is what I'm going to see this one. We'll still hit the query result reuse. But, um, you know, basically I, I do it the most for the count stars. Okay. So we saw the three caches a, a, as well. All right. Moving on. A dynamic view using window functions. This is how to get the data definition language. We already had a sneak peek at that. That's just another way. You could also, uh, put table, function, proc, um, database, schema, so on and so forth to get the entire DDL uh, spit out for analyzing or to check in with your source control and do DevOps. We have a lot of show table functions, like you see showing the trade table, what's the table comment, all of these different things, the data, the bytes, the compressed, everything's at the compressed level, you know, various more advanced features like search optimization. Okay, so we saw the trade level granularity for this buying, selling, closing Amazon, as you can see. This is where I was saying this This is what powers that position table, right? So you see the, tr the 3 billion rows of trade level granularity each day buying, selling, or holding is the three possible actions. And we could get the data definition language for the trade table. As you can see here, it is a trade table cluster by that trader symbol and date. And essentially these, this is the varchars date. So this is all uh, ANSI 92, um, you know, uh, compatible and a uh, Snowflake has a lot more uh, functions on top of that ANSI, extending the ANSI standard such as this one, Python function to generate fake data. So we created a fake function. And that's just what happened. I called it. Let's see if I go over here. There you go. As you can see, this is the fake function. Ooh, let me just run it first. 
So if I wanted to in table generators, just a way to, in this case, create 10 rows of synthetic traders. So you see, there are my synthetic traders. I, I created them in the US name. If you wanted to have UK names or some other kind of names, you could do that as well. As you could see now they're in the UK style. So I'll just change them back to US. Um, but yeah, this is how I generated fake data for the traders, which we'll see very soon. Let's see if we float over this functions over here and click this, we can actually see the definition. There we go. So as you can see, you're essentially hosting Python. So Python, Scala, and Java functions are kind of first class objects where you can do functions, procedures of those three languages inside Snowflake, along with SQL and JavaScript, right? So the Python, Scala, Java folks don't feel neglected. We're using Python 3.8. As you can see, it's using the Python faker and the simple JSON to do all of this. And this is actually from uh, James Weekly. It is a snowflake, I believe he's a super a data superhero. And he kind of open sourced this and wrote a medium article. It's all in this open source lab. Um, when we create this function later, as you can see the Python faker function, this is where we talk about how they did that. If you wanted to see the link. Credit to James Weekly, as you can see, published in the Snowflake Medium channel, showed how to write it and what's the benefit and how it's actually improved upon his version one, which was using an AWS Lambda external function. But now because Snowflake allows you to host Python natively inside Snowflake, he was like, well, maybe I'll just do it inside Snowflake. So you don't have that kind of hop externally. So it's faster as well and ultimately a lower cost. Okay. So. That's to generate fake data. All right, cross database join. So as you can see, if I grab the random date and you could see I'm querying the database that I'm in, this FinServe AM, and I'm querying a share. So essentially in Snowflake, all of the databases that I have here, whether it's a share, so economy data atlas, as you can see, this is the actual share that we're getting the stock market data from, as you can see. There's an economy schema with this table, and then there's a lot of views here. So I'm using a certain view called this, just like US indexes and something, uh, actually, let's go all the way down and see. But as you can see, it's, it's we could actually filter for here, but I'll just go the old school way. Down over here, and you see a lot of data provided for complementary on Snowflake by uh, Noma. As you can see, okay, in, in, so ultimately it's from investing.com, US stock prices, a secure view with 13 columns. Let's see if we can see the definition. No, nope, definitions are not available in shared views and that's by design because they are a secured view. But this is where we are getting those stock prices from. You see this various data sources and we're going to mount this when you look at how we build this data, we're actually going to use this data. As you can see, it's at the frequencies that D stands for data level granularity. And there is, when you go to the normal economy data analysis, as you can see, there's various ways to contact support, there's documentation, and you can, you know, reach out to NOMA for more info or to get, see some of their more advanced data sets. And they also have this very great data cataloging among other things that they provide in their platform. Okay. So moving on, instant real-time market data with neither copying nor FTP. So as you can see, I am querying this data, right? So as a kind of like database developer historically in my career, I kind of didn't like having to do that whole ETL stuff, right? Because ultimately you, it was a requirement before the business got whatever answer they were looking, like the front office, right? Or the trader or risk manager. But now with Snowflake, that ETL portion goes away and we had one customer say, yeah, it used to take them two to six months easily just to get what I can do with this one query right here, right? As you can see, I'm querying this, this share, right? And they have the data science experts or whatever to get Starbucks data in this place for today is May 26, well, today's May 30th, but yes, they had the closing prices and everything as of May 26. And as you can see, so this provides you with, with no need to FTP, no need to copy, getting instant access to that data. And of course we have in the, in the finance space, FactSet, Standard Poor's, Capital IQ, so on and so forth. 
of a lot more data set. And, and that's one of the leading drivers for Snowflake is you're part of this network effect on Snowflake, right? So you see, we're getting the Starbucks closing price with no FTP, okay? So we showed how to get the data, how to get the shares of this data. Let's move on to DevOps, right? So a lot of people, we're going to show zero copy clone and time travel, right? So what I'm going to do is show you, I'm going to promote myself to account M. And before I was this kind of like FinServe AM, FinServe Financial Services Asset Manager admin. I just promoted myself to account admin. As you can see, when I promoted myself, I, I get access to a lot more role databases, as you can see right here. And I'm going to drop a database if it exists called QA1. So this is, I just dropped that. Essentially, this is showing you how to do DevOps. And the benefit of Snowflake is you can do DevOps all on your production account. So I remember being a DBA prior to Snowflake. And whenever I saw folks doing development and production, and sometimes without source control, I was like, whoa, what are you doing? Like extremely risky, right? Especially doing development work against production because even one bad query can take down Snowflake. But because of Snowflake's workload isolation where these, these virtual warehouses separate compute from, from compute, right? You separate compute from storage, but you also separate compute from compute. The ability to, to take down Snowflake is a lot harder now, right? Um, let's just say it's a lot harder. And as a DBA, you could put guardrails up. And so you can actually do development on Snowflake, and that's what we're going to simulate here, right? So I dropped a database that exists called FinSurveyMQA1, and I'm going to clone this database, right? So this is the ability to clone objects, and not just the table level, but pretty much unique to Snowflake is, is the ability to, just, to clone at the schema and at the database level out of the box of one line of command, right? So watch this. Create database, Fins of AM, QA1, clone Fins of AM. So I am going to run that command. And without even turning on my warehouse, look at it. It's just a metadata operation. In, in under four seconds, I created a clone. And I happen to name it Fins of AM, QA1. So as you can see right here, it looks, smells exactly like my Fins of AM database right here. Right? Because it looks like 3 billion rows. Right. And it's 100% the same. It's just a virtual like metadata pointing at it. So now I could do all of my development, QA, testing, UAT against this. And think about how game changing this is. Right. In a past life, I used to own a two terabyte data warehouse and I could never get my backups and restores to complete by Monday morning because after Friday's middle office stuff, work was done around, I'd say, 8 p.m., if the backup restore started, it wouldn't finish before Monday morning I started a business. And so I was always developing against stale data in my dev and QA environments. But with Snowflake, I just recreated a dev or QA or UAT environment in four seconds at pretty much zero cost because you're only paying for the diff on the storage if you do any changes, right? And so clones are zero additional storage cost. Storage cost is only on the deltas. So if I have one terabyte in production, if I change, you know, one tenth of the terabyte info, I only pay for that, you know, 1.1 automatically compressed terabyte. Essentially the one terabyte in production, one compressed terabyte in production and, and the one tenth of a compressed terabyte. So it's really a game changing, you know, benefit of Snowflake, right? So you could see here, in, if I just run queries against production, this is that trade table, as you can see. And if I change it, there's, there's one, 1,100 rows. If I see on, on this QA, it looks exactly the same. Same 1,100 rows. Everything's the same. Now, watch what happens. If I update, let's say I update this FinServe AM QA1 database to, I want to change the Amazon symbol to General Electric. As you can see, just five seconds to make that update. And I can use time travel for DevOps and rollback. So I can always grab this query ID here, but I can also grab it pro programmatically. Or I can look at the query history because it's an immutable log for everybody, right? And we could time travel to see before the DML delete, before our data manipulation. So even though, as you can see, bef even though I did update the records to a Amazon, right? I could still see them using time travel. Let me let me show you this for a sec. If we look at current time on this QA1, remember I updated this, there's zero Amazon record. So 
the currently there are no Amazon records in, in QA1. Notice what happened. Production is 100% fine because I'm doing development here in QA. So, but even though they don't exist in this QA1 in current time, I have up to 90 days of configurable. So I could configure it from zero to 90 days. And you could see, so I could see this trade table, the, the records before I did that, right? Again, makes a DBA job and a developer job a lot easier in DevOps, right? And so I could always undo that thing, right? Instead of finding a full, full, uh, you know, database log or transaction log, a DBA could no sweat, uh, reinsert the state of right back into Snowflake. So I'm just going to essentially undo my delete by, in my case, just reinserting that data into this trade table. And so now, um, my data, if I look at it now, right, because I undid it now, QA is going to look exactly the same as before the Amazon records were restored, right? So I just demonstrated, quick recap, I demonstrated zero copy clone to essentially make instant dev QA UAT sandboxes at database schema or table level. And then I made an update and then I undid my update. Okay. Actually, this should be undo our update. So I, before, yeah, I will make some improvements. We will undo our update here and undo our update here. Okay, great. So we can also undrop tables, right? So look at this. We have this table and let's just say it's a production table. We drop this table. Trade is successfully dropped. If we refresh or look at the count stars, you can see that table in QA is like, whoa, where'd that table go? No, in production, it's still there. It was fine. If we run this query, and I'm just going to select it and hit the run button, so count star, it does not exist, right? So normally in any other database, you would be freaking out or very scared uh, for your job and probably hoping you bought the DBA recently, some pizza and beer, because this is kind of dangerous, right? But rest assured on Snowflake, it's a lot easier. We could always just undrop a table, assuming that you've had, you know, one to 90 days of time travel. So we will undrop this table. And so it is right back, All right? So the, the table is right back. If I refresh now, everybody's here. So your doctor will like it the stress level is a lot less. Now, remember, like I said, we have Soulflake has zero copy clone and time travel at the database level and schema level, right? So I remember, I think it was Elasticsearch where somebody wrote a blog that they, they accidentally dropped their Elasticsearch database. And one of the comments said, and you know, they talked about how it took them, you know, one to three days of a lot of sweating and, and miracles and being a hero to bring it back. On Soulflake, one line of SQL, watch. So we're going to drop this database called FinSurvey and QA1. And we hit refresh. And as you can see, that QA1 database is gone. And to prove it, we will select star from this trade table. And of course, it doesn't exist. But no worries, Snowflake, undrop database. And instantly, it is right back. So if I see refresh, it is right back. Again, Snowflake is, when you think of Snowflake, you think of a lot of, you never kind of hit like the bare data. You hit, there's like a, a meta, there's multiple layers of metadata around it, which is what, what you're looking at. Okay. And so now dropped it. And now we could always, you know, drop the database for real. Okay. Or, it, you know, drop it so that I, I don't bring it back to time travel. Okay. So there it's gone. And of course we could always uh, suspend warehouses instantly. Just like uh, showing that because, oh, it actually suspended itself, see? But if you wanted to, you could suspend immediately right there. Um, and I'm just going to use this schema again. All right. So, wow, we did a lot of stuff. What we just did was we showed, I'm going to do a recap now, right? We showed you this, this snow site database, showed you how to get this data and we showed how to run this, you know, FinSer 40 queries, the script. Now, what I'm going to do is I am going to close all of this. And essentially I will actually, maybe I will take a screenshot of this because I'm going to recreate this 
on a new account to, to show you how to build everything that I just did. Okay. So let's, let me see how I'm I going to do this. Okay. I'm going to close all these windows and log out. Okay. So come over here and I will log out. And I will log into an account. Let me just go in this way. I have another Snowflake account. This one's called Demo 171. I'm going to log in here. So this is, now you can follow along to recreate this demo on your own. Okay, as you can see, there's no dashboard named Fincer AM. There's no worksheet. So I'm going to show you step-by-step step how to recreate this demo. So we're going to go to this Snowflake Labs SF Guide Financial Services Asset Management. Click the description for it. Set you go to the setup folder and we're going to click this Fincer Demo 10 setup. We are going to click this copy raw file and we're going to come over here, click, and we'll be in worksheets and we'll click the plus sign and we're going to say SQL worksheet. We're going to paste that script that we just had from over there. Scroll to the top just by scrolling to the top. And we are going to rename the script. Click on rename. And if I think it was called FinServe. Let's see. What do we go? Let's call it FinServe Demo 10 Setup. Okay. Just like what, what it is called uh, in the GitHub to make it easier on all of us. FinServe 10 Demo Setup. And as you can see, that worksheet is renamed, and we could come back to this just by going to worksheets and, and clicking on it. While we're here, you get to see there's the ability to move these sheets, duplicate it, format, query, delete, and also show any keyboard shortcuts. I happen to be on a on a MacBook, and so I get all of these window shortcuts. I'm uh, shortcuts, and if you're on Windows uh, or Linux, it will show you a Windows or Linux specific shortcut. Okay, so. Ah, uh, this script, I am going, what is it going to do? And then uh, I will, I will basically tell you what it's going to do. And then I'm going to do it. It's going to use account admin, create a role called Fincer AM admin, create these two virtual warehouses before we were using this Fincer one. And there's one called uh, extra small constant. We are going to use this one for the, the task, uh, I'm sorry, for the ability for the snow site dashboard to get the, the traders and the, and and the uh, underlying metadata for the queries. We'll see that very soon. And of course, permissions can be as granular as you want. You can create databases. We'll grant ownership to this FinServer admin. So it's basically showing our role-based asset control model, our RBAC model on Snowflake, as you can see. And we're going to, well, let me just run it and explain more. So I just hit um, Command A, which is to select all. Essentially, it is now running all of these queries. All right, so it just ran everything, and that was extremely fast. If we want to click, I'm going to hold down Command and click this Home icon. If we wanted to, that will allow me to come back home. And if we go to Activity, we could always click uh, and see this is, these are the queries that I just ran. As you can see, it was very fast. Each one was just taking milliseconds to create this first setup script. Okay. And it's item opponent. If you want to command A and rewrite it again, it'll sign because you can see it has, if not exist, um, and all of these type of commands. So um, feel free to run it again if you need. Now, what we're going to do is cr put the second script in. Okay. So we'll come back to our GitHub. Click on this script, Fitzer Demo 20 Marketplace, and click on this copy raw file. Come back to Snow Site, and we're going to hit this plus icon right here while we're in worksheets. And SQL worksheet again. Paste our script. Okay, and let's scroll back to the top. And we're going to call this FinServe Demo 20 Marketplace, just like here. So, rename Fincer Demo 20 Marketplace. Okay. So, 
this this one's gonna fail. This 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 line nineteen is gonna fail. Let me actually fail it for you. If we run this, and this, so this is test driven development. This will fail because the economy data atlas does not exist or not authorized, right? Because there is no share. If we come over here to databases, there's no share called or no database mounted as economy data atlas. Okay, so I'm actually going to copy this because what we're going to do is we're going to get that Noma share and mount it, quote unquote mount, uh, as 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 this economy data out of share. And now the benefit is we don't have to you know, screen scrape or FTP or whatever to get that data in. It's already in the Snowflake marketplace. So we click on, you click, I'm holding control or com command click here to click the home. It'll open up a new tab and I'm gonna go to the marketplace. And this is the Noma Economy Data Atlas. You could see the most popular one. Feel free to click on this free data if you wanted to see the other free data sets here. There's over 300 now plus. I can't, oh no, wait, 567. I have to keep up with the science. You see the Noma Economy Data Atlas is the one. So you could just click here and, 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 and we're going to hit get soon. Or if you happen to not have it on your screen, just search for Noma Economy and it should come up there. You see there's very 167 data products. Wow. A lot of data products that meet that. We're just the tip of the iceberg. So we're going to find the Noma economy data atlas, right? So you click on it, you can see more info on what it provides, right? A lot more indicators, right? For leading indicators, some sample queries on GDP and inflation over time, exchange rates. Wow. There's a lot of data here. And as uh, you can see, the cloud region availability. I happen to be on Snowflake AWS, AWS, and it is behind the scenes. It is globally on automatically replicated cross cloud, um, AWS, Azure, and GCP. I happen to be here. And so I will hit the get button. And these are my options. And you, um, let's rename it. So even though it is presented here as economy data analyst, um, yeah, I would just put it, I will just call it the same thing, economy data analyst, all lowercase with the underscores in the middle, just to make my life easier. And which roles in addition to account admin can access this database? So you could say which roles, um, because you could, you could say, okay, I only want the fins of admin or whatever, but I'm just going to make it public just because, the, and, and so public is kind of like the universal role, uh, on Snowflake. So anybody that has access to my account can also query this data and they'll only be able to read only you're only able to read only any share so which is fine because it's, it's it's not really hypersensitive hr pii type data right it's just some data share so i will hit get and essentially just like that i am ready to query this data and of course i could always hit the query data and you know run some of the sample data queries that they provide to me uh, U.S. inflation over time, so on and so forth, but you can play around on that on your own. Okay. So now what happens is if I mounted it as a uh, economy data analyst, if I refresh here, you could see it just here. It magically appears, right? And this could be, you know, terabytes, petabytes of data, doesn't matter. Get it instantly because there's no data movement, right? No cost, right? for us to essentially give you a pointer, as you can see, the source is a share to this data as we covered earlier. So now this query will, will work, right? Our, our test-driven development works. And so what are we going to do? Actually, now I'll just run it and explain it as we go along, or you can hit Command A and hit Run, but I'll, I'll do this one interactively. We are going to create a table to exclude symbols as they have the same symbol in NASDAQ and NYSE. So just for the purposes of this demo, I didn't want to deal with that. Um, and so we were now that it's unique, we can just say, hey, give me the whatever ticker symbol. And you know that it's not duplicated between NASDAQ and NYSE, right? And then if the closing price is zero, we will also exclude that just because it was you know, I, I didn't want to deal with if the closing price is zero, right? And then if we have the stock market history, as you can see, I'm creating a transient table. There's many different table types, but the 
the three kind of like core ones are temporary, transient, and permanent. Permanent has the the zero to nine days of time travel. Transient is what we're generally working with in this demo because demo purposes is just zero to one days of time travel, right? And that's generally used for ETL tables or dimension tables that can be easily recreated. So as you can see, where we basically saying, okay, give me, this is the stock history table that is used in that position view later. And it essentially just orders the data by company and date and gives us the data set that we want, right? So this is essentially like data cleansing. And then of course we can add col comments on, on columns and that's used for the information schema. And this is the Python faker or fake function that we were getting from the James Weekly Medium article, credit to James. So this is how you can essentially make it very easy for your business users because you're providing the Python Scala or Java function um, you know, immediately. And of course you could import your own and there's a thousand plus Anaconda packages as well. And so if we wanted to run this one, this is our smoke test, essentially showing those same, you know, just randomly creating 10 fake names. Okay, so we just, Quick recap, we, uh, let's go back to script 10. We created the, the users, the warehouse, the computing power. And then in Hellboy here, we mounted the share and created some data quality checks to make sure everything is working fine. And we created a Python function to create fake names for our trader. Let's go and move on to script 30, 30. This is gonna run longer because it's creating 3 billion synthetic trains. So we're going to copy the raw file, come over here, back to Snowflake, click the plus sign, SQL worksheet, and paste. All right. So now this is, this is going to be a beast. So I'm just going to hit command A and then explain it as we go along. Command A and now I'll just hit the run button up here. Just to change it up a little. And so what is it doing? You can look sizing up compute. So we play complete quick and prepare the same plus creating a traders table using this limit trader parameter defaulted at it's actually it should be a hundred traders in this version create a watch that is actually uh, invalid we don't have a watches table in this version but this is correct properly three billion synthetic trades and we're creating window function views for the position so as you can see here it just set the rows sizing up to extra extra large because of the ability. So now Snowflake has the ability to size up. As you can see, we're using much larger compute now because we're doing a lot heavier things. And so that's the benefit of Snowflake is you're essentially getting compute on demand instantly, right? Notice there was no five to 10 minute startup time to get assigned this very strong computing power. Now, obviously I'm paying more for that computing power, but the human being cost is a lot less, right? I don't have to wait for it, right? Because ultimately when you look at a total cost of ownership model, the human beings are the most expensive, right? So I love not having to wait. And so I essentially get from this running pool of compute, this two extra large, and now it's running these various queries. As you can see, there's one. So let's let's keep on going. As you can see, it's set a variable called limit trader. The, the portfolio managers get uh, about 10 traders reporting to them. Creating a sequence, a sequence is a unique number generator. And as you can see here, creating a, 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 the PMs, right? This is where we use that faker function to create the, the PMs. And here we're creating transactions. You know, you, and we're using a tr transaction here, even though we don't need it, but I, I just wanted to demonstrate transactions, right? You're beginning a transaction, you're creating a table for traders creating those fake uh, trader names and then putting some random functions to just grab the assigned a PM to a trader and how much a trader can buy per day, right? So we're going to use all these buying power functions later on when we're using a Cartesian join to create those synthetic trades, right? And some various comments. I mean, technically I don't need a transaction, but it's kind of nice like doing it all at once. So whenever you need to do transactions in Snowflake, that's how you do it pretty straightforward. And of course there was a smoke test. And now here's where we're running this, this time because it's creating a trade table, right? As you can see, comment is trades made and cash used. The unique key is symbol exchange date. As you can see, notice something. I'm creating this buy action and you can see buying it for from 1981 moving forward. So that's 30 years of buying action. 
every single time I create a table where it's a trade table, I always order by. That's a rule of thumb that I recommend on Snowflake, right? Especially for customer facing tables, trader sim one day. As you can see, even here, when I was creating a, a trader, I did it on whatever, order by over here, uh, just because the, the right one, three, many model benefits from it, right? And, and also it's a lot fewer microartitions and the filter is a lot either. So you can see here, then the holds are right here, right? So they started holding from 2010 beyond. Oh, it moved on. Insert into trader. Okay, so now it's doing some for this trader Charles, which is a special case that we wanted to showcase. And and wow, are we done? No, no, I guess we're done. Yeah, I think everything is done. So yeah, and it sized down to a small. Wow. Let's let's go to our query history. Just just show you what happened as I was explaining that. Wow, this this is quite fast. So essentially. As we were chatting, as we were explaining things, this large table took a minute, 21 seconds. And and then so total time to create those 3 billion rows is, is the addition of this, which is about, about three minutes, right? Three minutes, three minutes, I don't know, whatever that is. Uh, three minutes and five seconds, 15, okay. But basically it is very fast to create those 3 billion rows. And then it did whatever else it did. And then it automatically size down the compute. So this is, a, uh, notice the, or the auto suspend on that was pretty much instantly, right? You didn't need to, you could auto suspend instantly the compute. So you get the compute power you need, and then you automatically size down, right? And so we created all those synthetic trades and here we added a clustering key. So if we look over here and refresh, FinServe AM, public, the trade, the trade table we created, see that cluster key linear trader symbol date? This is where we create cluster key. This only took milliseconds, right? Why is that alter table trader cluster? Look, it took 647 milliseconds because it's just a metadata operation that says, hey, this table, sh anytime it is ordered, it should be ordered by trader symbol and date. Now notice what I recommend is data engineers always add data ordered by this. But I'm trying to future-proof this code, right, in this big data system, because let's say I, as a developer, I get assigned to another project or an intern takes over or what have you. If they're adding data and it's not sorted, then the business user will say, hey, how come this is not performing well? And that's always a bad thing. But I essentially future-proof this object by saying there's a cluster key here, and it's also should be auto clustering is turned on. Right, so if I, I'm gonna rerun this query again, show tables like trade. As you can see, if I scroll to the right, there's three billion rows. Automatic cluster is on. That just means that it will automatically maintain itself. And that's a completely online operation, meaning that you can continue, people can con continue querying it even when it is clustering in the background, which is quite nice. Okay. And if you ever wanted to enable or disable automatic clustering, you just run that command that I commented out. Okay, and here's this position view, which we kind of explained before. That's the window functions that calculate our number of shares and our the cashews. This is the position now, or as I said, there's probably a more efficient way than scanning three billion row trade table, but it's what I could do when I developed it at the time. At some point I will make this more efficient, but right now it's pretty efficient. And then you could size down to save credits. As you can see, we just literally size that down to a small. Actually, I'm going to improve this because I want to intentionally suspend this alter warehouse suspend. And so that way it will suspend um, before it sets a small, but either way, it would have automatically um, suspended. So I should save me about two minutes of compute, theoretically, as far as I know. But yeah, it doesn't hurt to do that, right? Because you're suspending it, especially when you're using these larger sizes. Cool. Actually, I'm going to check that in. You, If you ever want to see me check in something immediately, off to warehouse, Fincer DevOps warehouse suspend. So we're going to check that in for your benefit. All right. Okay. 
there you go. So let's go. Oops, I didn't name this one, right? So this is FinServe AM, FinServe Demo 30. So FinServe 30, FinServe Demo 30. This is DDO, right? We created a lot of DDO. All right, we're almost there, right? Well, with that, we had the snow site as well, but hang, hang in there, please. Hang in there. We're going to do FinServe 40, which we took a lot of time explaining, but this is essentially our smoke test. We don't have to explain it again. So now we go to FinServe Demo 40. So we'll come back over here. SQL Worksheet. We, you know, I'll just paste it in. Scroll back to the top. Click the ellipsis. Rename. FinServe Demo 40. And I think there was called Queries. And I am just going to hit Command Return after I select all. We'll go Command A. Essentially, it's just flying through these queries that we kind of explain one by one. And that's basically my smoke test to make sure this demo is working fine. All right, sweet. So everything's working fine. The FinServe AM database is here. I'm just going to scroll back to the top and use this FinServe AM admin row. Okay, great. All right, so quick recap on what we just did. We literally just install this complete demo end-to-end uh, -end, and as you can see pretty um, easy to use right script 10 script 20 script 30 script 40 and we grab the the marketplace data in script 20 to mount that economy of data out of share so if you actually want to time it into end and if you and you could always rebuild the demo ah if you want to drop the demo later you could just click this go to the optional for it is a fence of demo 90 reset that will drop all these objects, but we don't want to do that right now because what we want to do next is we have our database and it's all working as our FinServe demo 40 queries um, was working. Now what we want to do is create the Snowsite dashboards. Okay, so that's the final part, right? As you can see, first is we create the filters. As you see, click on 60 filter. Filters are special keywords that resolve as a subquery or list of values. Feel free to click that. So this is going to be interesting. Quick explanation of filters. You see custom filters. You could click on the Snowflake documentation to see more what it's about. Benefit of filters, single version of truth for your business definition. You just don't need to write additional SQL. And when you change a filter, all queries that use it have the latest definition. So we're going to create a warehouse, which we already did, called Extra Small Constant Warehouse. So it's a constant warehouse. So hopefully that's kind of like the future proof it. So other developers don't come along and say, hey, maybe I should resize this. Because we always want to know it's a, a, extra small. And set it to auto suspend at one minute to save costs, which is what we did. These filters are used by the FinServe Demo 60. Actually, that should get changed to 60 snow site. Okay. Okay. All right. Great. So what we're going to do is we are going to copy this one. Oops. So we're going to copy this one called FS Trader. So essentially, as you can see, they're all prefixed with this kind of colon FS Trader. So FS stands for, in our case, FinServe, and it's a trader. Display name is Trader. Traders with position in FinServe Asset Management. Like, notice what it's doing. Select the distinct trader from this trader table that we created. Okay, and that's what's actually used to populate the dashboard dropdown. So we're going to create the first one called Trader, the next one called Trade Date, and then finally for ticker symbol. Okay, and so let's just get to it. I'm going to click on Snowflake. I'm just going to close the queries to the right. And I go to the home and go to dashboards. Okay, and we're going to create it. What should we call it? Eh, we'll call it like FinServe Asset Management Dashboard. Yeah, that sounds generic enough. So you see, we go over here to Dashboards. We click on this plus dashboard, and we could call it, you could call it whatever you want. I'll call it FinServe AM, FinServe Financial Services Asset Management uh, Dashboard. Yeah, pretty generic. And we hit Create Database. Okay. So we're presented with this beautiful blue new tile, add tiles to get started. Actually, no, wait, sorry, we're not doing that yet. We got to add our filters first. So I'll, I'll just, what I did was I hit new tile and I'm just going to return because I don't want that new tile. 
what I want to do is create filters. I click this button right here in the dashboards and I click filters. Oh, I actually have some of my old fil filters. I'm actually going to delete those because those were from an earlier version. You won't have this experience, but I'm going to delete those old filters. Into the BAM date, don't need, yes. Bear with me. Now you get to see what filters are in general as I remove some of the stuff from the previous version. Traitor, nope. Delete. Okay, date bucket date range, program name. Oh, interesting. How many is that? Okay, so ignore all the other stuff. And so to create filter, let me just do that again. You click on this kind of filter icon and you click filter. The display name, oh, you know what? Let's, let's do this. Let's split the screen. So we'll have one screen over here. Perfect. Now the display name is trader, as you can tell right there. So I'll just type this in trader. The SQL keyword is that colon sign. So as you see on line 19, FS trader for friends of trader. And then we'll just copy and paste this line, line 21, traders with positions. Nope. Let's do that again. Right click, traders with positions in the FinServe Asset Management Network. Now, row controls who can update and is used when refreshing query by option. Now, it's uh, a, a best practice to not use account admin for day-to-day -day kind of DBA or financial services admin stuff. So we're actually going to grant FinServe AM admin to own this one and for all three filters that we're about to use. That's why we had to create all those roles in the warehouses first, right? And then remember, we're going to use this extra small constant warehouse, or you could use one if you have one already. But it's always good to use an extra small for this type of stuff that just runs in the background. And, you know, it's it, these are relatively small queries for the best bang for your buck, as people say. Now, options via query. So we're going to say that's, we're going to write the query, and we're just going to paste line 22. So select distinct trader, from FinServe AM public dot trader order by one. Always good to hit that run icon to make sure it is what you think it should be. Then you can see there's 101 traders, the ones that are randomly created by the Python function. And we just created one named Charles. If you think of uh, uh, Warren Buffett and Charles Munger, that's where I got the inspiration to name this trader Charles. All right. And let me get this out of the way. Okay, so as you can see right there, we are good. So we have created this one trader and it looks good. Oh, let's keep scrolling down. Um, oh, in our example, let's click on this when we refresh because now if you were in production and you needed something to to refresh hourly, you could set it at the default. But in our case, it is just daily is fine, right? Because even the the data kind of comes in daily. Now you could change it to wherever you want. But for our demo purposes, refresh daily is just fine, which essentially it will just run once a day to you know make sure these are the latest traders. All right, and then we hit the save button, the blue save. So as you could see, those are my traders right there. Oops, so come back to filters now, right? As you can see, my FS trader is there. Now I want to do the same, but for trade date. So I'll hit the blue filter button, display name. I'm looking at line 25 over here. I'm now we're doing the second one. So this is called trade date. SQL keyword is FS date, as you can see in line 24. Description, trade dates of FinServe asset management demo. and select distinct date from the trade table to generate that.
Oh, and we're going to, while we're here, we'll just set the warehouse to that extra small. And we're going to write our query. And there we are. Select the sync date from this trade table, and we're going to run it. All right, so we have data since 1981, because that's intentionally where we built this demo from. We'll hit done. And we will then scroll down, set the refresh to daily, and then hit save. All right. Now, go moving on to the next one. Plus filter, display name, what others will see. So this will be called ticker symbol. SQL keyword is FS symbol. And description is symbols traded by FinServe Asset Management Demo. Symbols traded by FinServe Asset Management Demo. Roll is good. Warehouse, extra small, constant warehouse. We're going to write our query. Line 32 over here. Select distinct symbol from trade order by one. I like putting a new line before the from. And let's get that select distinct symbol. This is, remember, this is query 3 billion rows to get the list of symbols that have been traded by our traders since 1981. There you go. Uh, probably thousands of them. Okay, and we're going to hit done. And scroll down, and we're going to refresh daily for purposes of this demo. And hit save. All right. So quick recap. What did we do? We created the three, oops, the three filters that we're going to use, FS date, FS symbol, FS trader. So if we come back to our here in GitHub, we did everything in this FinServe Demo 60 filter. Now we're going to create the dashboard. So FinServe Demo 70 still site. All right, so what is going on here? So BI tools require separate licenses. They can be costly and hard to share and learn. All right, so we're talking about the benefits of the Snowflake dashboard. With Snowflake, your benef Snow site, their benefits complementary with Snowflake. Uh, just a BA experience to dashboard, share, write queries, and scale compute. And unlimited concurrency for your single version of truth because all of your employees can connect to Snowflake at the same time. Uh, what we will see, dashboard for trader and symbol over time, deep dive into trades, cash, PL, position, and you can share with executives and authorized users. Okay, so this is going to require a little bit of interactivity as well. So what we will do is I'm going to shrink this window here, put it off to the side again, bring this off here. Alrighty, so let's create our dashboard. So we're going to do this one manually. So we're going to create the row. We're going to switch our row. I'm kind of like over here on line 20, but I'm doing it manually. FinServe AM is the row. FinServe AM admin is the row. And we're going to use the warehouse as this FinServe AM DevOps. Okay, so your screen should look like this. And make sure it looks like that because then the permissioning is just easier later on. And you're going to be using this DevOps warehouse, which is generally a small to do most of your queries, just like I was doing the during the demo. And we are going, so let's see, use schema fincerveam.public. Okay. And if we need to resize to a small, it's already a small, so we don't need to do any of that. Basically, your screen should look similar to this. Now, let's grab that first one. Let me see if I could shrink this down a little. There we go. Oops, maybe a little too small for those eyes. Okay, so symbol position over time line chart. I'm just going to copy all of this stuff. So in row right. So what at a high level, what's going on? Row one is going to use these three objects, just like in the demo that we saw before. Row two is going to use these, and then row three is going to use this. Actually, let me see if I could do something kind of cool. I'm going to use, here's a, here's a cool trick. I'm going to open up an incognito window and go to the, so now we're in incognito. I can open up connected to Snowflake accounts using the Chrome browser. 
And of course, if you have, let's say, Chrome or Safari or Microsoft Edge, um, you could do that as well. So I'm going to go to my one password and get my password off, off screen. So. All right. And what I want to do is just show you the dashboard so that you can know what we're building. We're going to basically build row one, which is all of this first. And this first one is called symbol position over time line chart. You can always click on this ellipsis right here and click edit query. And you know, if I were doing this on my own, I would copy and paste, but I'm just going to actually do it uh, from the GitHub because that's going to be your experience, right? And I like it having a little empathy. And then we're going to create the chart, which is right here. As you can see when I click, so this was the results, which is the default, but if you click chart, this is how we create the chart. As you can see, we're going to create similar for this cashews, market value, so on and so forth. Right? So let's go. So you're going to see me kind of float between this incognito one and the one I'm building. Okay. So coming back over here. All right. Perfect. So what I want. Okay. In the slow site that we're building, you're going to click new tile. And we are going to paste. Oops, that didn't do anything. We are going to copy and paste, in my case, line 28 to 35, this query right here. All right, so let me kind of maximize this. Oops. Symbol position over time. Let me just run it right I'll hit Command Enter. You must provide a ticket value. Okay, good. So remember, this is what we created. These are the filters. So I'd like doing, let's say, last 12 months for time. Ticker symbol. Yeah, let's use Amazon. You can use Amazon. Trader. I like Charles. Or you could use another one. And now I will hit run. And as you can see, it would automatically apply. Position does not exist or not authorized. Interesting. Oh, okay. No database selected. I think that's why. Okay, perfect. So what I want to do is come over here. Right. Fits, right. Because so let me, let me show you what just happened. Compilation error, because it just said select position. And Snowflake's like, great. What's the database and schema? Because I didn't specify it. So I'm going to specify here. Now, normally if, if because I didn't want to say you could always do it in code. Actually, I could always put it over here, call it finsurveyam.position dot whatever, uh, finsurveyam dot public dot position. But I currently don't want to, I haven't had a need to uh, do that yet. And I think I'm kind of future proofing this demo for in case I want to do DevOps where let's say I wanted to point the same dashboard to a QA instance. But for right now, we'll just click here, finsurveyam public, right? So as you can see, I'm showing you now how to manually set it to this schema. And so if we hit run now, this should work. Perfect. Okay. So as you can see, that took whatever, two seconds to run this Amazon closing prices, blah, blah, blah. And we're going to make a chart, right? So line chart for cash used market value, right? So we're going to take the cash used market value, basically all these things. And then for X axis, we're going to put it at a, at a year. Okay. So let's go to chart over here. And we're going to create this, right? So cash use, perfect. And we're going to add a column for market value. As you can see on line two over there, market value, right? And then sum is fine. I think I had some, I'll just keep doing some, even though probably the other ones work as well. PL, oops. So here's PL. And then I'm going to add another column. For next one is number of shares cumulative, right? And then finally, I'm going to add a column for closing price. There you go. And for the X axis the date, I'm going to make it at a year. Okay. So we scroll back up and here's the chart. It was a line chart, which is the default and good. So we don't have to change this and we will hit run. Oops. Hopefully that's saved. You must provide a value for a ticker symbol filter. 
which I believe we did, which was Amazon. Maybe we'll hit save. There we go. Oh, that sucks. All right, well, we have to do that again. As you can see, I developed these things once and really need to change them again. Um, so I will click this, so cache you some. Uh, let me just maximize this a little. Okay, and then market value. So add column, market value, add column, p &L, add column, number of shares cumulative, add column, close price. And then we're going to x-axis will be date and add a year the bucket tape. Okay, and then we are, we can hit run. Perfect, let's go back to results over here. Uh, let's kind of scroll down to see our query again. Now, now we are basically done, right? We created, and so we're going to click chart, sorry. And essentially, we, we made the chart what we want to look like, and now we can return to the dashboard. There you go, right? Uh, so now this will work. Let's, if we go back to here, we call this symbol line 28 over here, symbol position over time line chart. So let's name this object. If we click on the tile and click edit query, I believe. Oh, perfect. Up here, we're going to name it. So symbol position over time line chart. As you can see, you have various options. Uh, you can move these tiles to other dashboards, duplicate them, so on and so forth. Oh, show shortcuts. Okay. All right, great. So we just named it. And so we come back here and you can see we have one tile. So this is our first row. It's starting to look like this dashboard. You see, we just created this tile over here. We're going to create this next tile, symbol position over time table. So let's come back to here, symbol position over time table. I will just copy all of this. This one's going to be straightforward because as you can see, it's just data. All right, so symbol position over time. So we can click this plus icon and new tile from worksheet. Symbol position over time table. There you go. So I just clicked on this and then just pasted it in. So this one's super fast. So I just Click run. And there you go. That just created this, this query, symbol position over time. If we turn to dashboard, now it's on the bottom, but let's see if I could drag and drop it to be side by side. See that? So let me just do that again. Oops. You can resize this. What I'm going to do is kind of grab the title and kind of mouse click and then drag. I'm going to drag it to the right of this one. There you go. So now it's starting to look, oops, other way around. There you go. So now your screen should look like mine, right? You have the chart we created here and then the timetable we created the second one. So you can see we've created these two and now we're gonna add this symbol trade action table. So coming back over here. And we're gonna copy and paste all of this. Again, this one's gonna be very easy as well. So anytime it's just a table and you don't have to do the charting like we do here, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and, and users like this because they could just click on the ellipsis and then view table and then they get to see the actual, ta you know, the table level data. And then they could download to Excel or connect Excel directly, so on and so forth, right? But they have all their data right here in the governed way. So coming back over here, we want to add a new tile, hit the plus sign. New tile from dashboard, from worksheet. Paste this third uh, query. Click symbol trade action table as our object, as our tile name. And then hit run. Unexpected symbol. Huh. Yeah, there we go. All right. So as you can see, this is the, the, the trade level granularity for 
you know, in this case, Amazon for the past 12 months for this trader, we see the, the holding, they were just holding this position. And so we're going to drag it up over there. So now we've created the first row, right? Now we'll create the second row. So the second row, so we created this first row, the second row, portfolio PL top 10 bar chart, right? It's a pretty one. So we're just going to be a bar chart. Um, as you can see, the portfolio PL. Actually, let me do this. I'm going to make this trader called Charles. So now it looks very similar to the Amazon one that we have. I'm going to change ticker symbol to Amazon and make it for 12 months, which is what we were doing at the other one. And so I will run this. So just to just show you what it should look like. All right. So we're going to create the portfolio PL top 10 bar chart. You see Tesla was the, the clear leader, Merck, Microsoft, Google, so on and so forth. Okay. So we'll create this portfolio PL top 10 bar chart. So come over here, row two. Portfolio PL top 10 bar chart. Let's do that. Okay. Plus sign. New tile from worksheet. And then we're going to name it Portfolio PL top 10 bar chart. And we hit run. Hmm. <clears throat> Somehow it doesn't like these comments, so I'm just going to recreate it. Here we go. So you see the same Tesla and Microsoft. We're going to click chart. And it is clearly not a bar chart. So what we're going to do is come over here to chart type, click bar. And you can leave it as is if, if it's clear, but probably not so actually i need to update the documentation because what we want let's just do the cheat sheet we'll click over here to the ellipsis we'll hit view chart and ah perfect that's what we want p and l is the sum so let's, let's take some notes while we're here oh you're going to see me make live edits to the github so we're going to make it a bar chart. Bar chart. And oh, I could hide that. PNL as the sum. Uh, PNL as the sum. Symbol none as the series. And then symbol none for the x axis all right and so for orientation it is kind of vertical i think that was the default can order by order direction descending okay we'll see if those are the defaults label hex axis as symbol okay we can always come back here so let's go over to here okay so there's my cheat sheet okay portfolio pnl bar chart bar chart pnl sum add a column for symbol Okay, I guess the aggregation doesn't really matter, but we'll just leave it as none. PL none, symbol none. X axis is symbol. All right. And what do we have? Oh, and then we want to make the order direction descending. <laughs> Let's see. Let's do it this way. Orientation is up. Grouping. Order bars by bar side. Order direction is descending. Series direction is ascending. Show label should label x axis as symbol. And let's hit run. 
Huh, I wonder why Tesla is over here on this side. Let me, maybe I need to essentially make it ascending. No, make it descending. Orientation grouping. Oh, grouping. There you go. Stacked. There we go. Okay. So we need to make the orientation grouping as stacked. So let's update the notes. Orientation grouping stacked. And we want to label label x axis with symbol. All right. So if we come back to return to the dashboard, there you go. Now it looks pretty much exactly like our portfolio PL top 10 bar chart right here. Okay, so now we're going to create this next one. What is this? The portfolio PL bottom 10 bar chart. Okay. So come back over here. Okay, portfolio PL bottom 10 bar chart. Click on the plus. New tile from worksheet, portfolio p &L, bottom 10 bar chart. We're going to click run. Okay. All right. Let me uh, see these are bottom 10. Let me come back over here on the working one. Click view chart pin split screen. So I want to make my chart look the same on the right. So for chart type, and I'm going to take notes off screen on my GitHub. So chart type is going to be line chart. And it will be PNL, sum, symbol, none, or series, and symbol, none, or X axis. And then, okay, so let's do that. Change it to a bar. P and L sum symbol is none. Symbol is none. So series x axis, okay. Everything looks the same. Orientation grouping, this is the key one. Grouping is going to be stacked. Okay. So let me make a note over there. Grouping will be stacked. Stretching is default, bar side, descending, ascending. Okay, so we're going to label the x-axis instead of 8, or well, whatever this is, label it. Yes, we're going to label the x-axis, so now symbol shows up. And uh, yeah, we're done. So we're going to click return. There you go. So now, let's return over here on... Oh, I actually have more in, oops, um, and my documentation. We also have this one, Portfolio p &L Current Scorecard. So let me just add this one, View Query. So you see, showing, I'll just show you what I'm doing behind the scenes. I'm going to add this documentation right here. Portfolio. Portfolio PL Current Scorecard. So this is. Oh, wait, I already have this here. No, I don't. Okay. 
portfolio PNL current scorecard and it's a scorecard chart. Cool. So score. Actually, what am I doing? Okay, scorecard chart. All right. So let me just copy this here. So in our target dashboard, we click the plus sign. New tile. And we're going to paste Portfolio PL Current Scorecard. Uh, let's just run it. All right, so I'm going to copy this, name my tile Portfolio PL Current Scorecard, go to Chart. And what it should look like is it should be Chart Type, should be Scorecard. So chart type will be scorecard. Ah, that was easy. PNL none, right? So let me just update the documentation. That's pretty straightforward. So just do a scorecard chart, right? which is kind of like what that says. Okay, great. So we are going to return. And we're going to drag and drop our current scorecard to be to the right. So now... If you look, we are almost done. Thank you for bearing with me. As you can see, we've created rows one and rows two. Now the final, the portfolio positions the current table. So final one, go to my GitHub over here. All right, portfolio position current table. Uh, new tile. Portfolio position current table. And let's run this. All right. And we will return. And it should already be on the bottom. Oops. So now we are pretty much done. As you can see, We've created this dashboard and it 100%, does it 100% looks like our previous one? And this is, oops, what have I done? Yep, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, this is it. So this is right, this is my current one and everything works, right? So in summary, yep, everything works, right? Both of them look pretty much exactly the same. This is the, the new demo account. So let's do a quick recap of what we have shown. We have shown how to build, actually, let me just commit the changes. We have shown how to query this and build this demo, this 3 billion rows, all open source and, and create snow site dashboards. And essentially you can test it with unlimited concurrency, all of your users clicking and hitting and you know, running these dashboards at the same time with no problems. You can scale up and down compute. You can do DevOps, zero copy clone, time travel, uh, all on Snowflake, uh, pretty much out of the box, right? So um, quite revolutionary stuff. Thank you very much. And uh, check back. We should have a quick start. This should be a quick start. So it'll be kind of step-by-step -step tutorials on this page. Just search for Friends of Asset Management coming soon. Stay tuned for that. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.